Hello everyone, I'm Katie Neal and welcome to Boringwood Physio and this is my clinic. Um, today is our last in the series of our running sessions that myself and Gemma Bitchup have been hosting. Thank you all so much for those of you that have been joining us every week. It's been lovely to see some similar faces or virtually be it. Um, and all of those that I know have been watching these videos on YouTube or once they've been uploaded. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I think coming up into June, I've had 19 years experience as a physio, which is an awful long time. Um, and Boringwood Physio is my clinic and it's part of a group of clinics um, called Physio Academy. And we're a group of physios that really are passionate about kind of health prevention, helping you really understand why you're having your injury and trying to teach you skills to manage it really effectively. So you don't actually have to come back, you're fine and you can carry on and do all those things that you love. We chose to do this session because a lot of us have had running clinics and those have all shut down. And the point of our running clinics is to really help you understand some of the things that may give you a little bit more risk of injury and try and help you manage it before it happens. So Gemma and I are doing these sessions so that we can still give you some knowledge, some things that you can hopefully find that are really helpful to reduce your risk of injury. And even if you're not injured, these should be things to try and help your performance. Today's session is really interesting. We're mixing up two slightly different topics. Gemma, although she is a uh, qualified nutritionist in her field as a running coach, has lots of practical advice um, about nutrition and what she sees in action with the athletes that she works with. So she's going to be doing the first part of the talk on nutrition and running. And then we're going to go through some really simple core strengthening exercises. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. And maybe do kind of two or three exercises afterwards that you can have a go with. So I'm going to hand over to Gemma now, and she's going to take the next part of the session. Over to you, Gemma. Thanks, Katie. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I think you probably all do now, but just in case, um, I'm a qualified England athletics coach and one of the head coaches at Gade Valley Harriers, which is the local running club in Hemel. I've been working with um, individuals and groups of runners from beginners, anything from beginners to competitive runners for probably over 10 years now. I really like to work with runners and help them understand their training and how they can influence their goals, whether it's performance or health related. I love working with people like Katie and other professionals um, in Physio Academy and outside actually to try and give runners an all round experience uh, and try and advise and hopefully inspire them, support their running and their training. So today we're talking about why the right fuel for your running um, is important. Now, nutrition is a really wide ranging topic. You're probably aware it's got lots of different approaches, many opinions as well. There are professionals who specialize in nutrition. And if it's something you particularly want to focus on, then it's probably best that you go down that avenue and find someone I know Katie and I can probably recommend. But for this morning, I'm going to try and keep my advice simple and practical so that you can be better equipped to make decisions on the best fueling and nutrition for you. As with all of the topics we've discussed, rather than focusing on trying to change the, the smallest things in your training plan, nutrition could be another area that you want to make um, changes in and it can be something that you can do, particularly lockdown or limited training you could focus on the nutrition so hopefully you can get some um, pick up some tips from today if there's any questions we'll run through them afterwards I apologize the first bit is a little bit sciencey technical but I, I feel that I have to put that in and then we're going to come on to some more practical ways after that so two things to think about as we go through this morning everybody is different and no one I'm going to call diet but way of eating works for for everyone including men and women are different, you're different, um, different ages, and as we age as well, our, our, our diet needs to change, and uh, between our training seasons. The second thing is when you eat is just as important as what you eat. It might be something you've thought of before, it might not be. 
So food should be seen as part of your training and not just a means to stop being hungry. Um, when it works, when your fueling works for you, it really helps you reach that full potential during your training. Also allows your body to adapt. So grow stronger, get faster, all the things you want to do as a runner. And when it doesn't work, no matter how much training you've put in, your body just won't be able to reach that potential and it might actually struggle to adapt. Now, note that there is a point that eating for performance is not always the same as eating for health. And hopefully I'll come on to examples of that later and be quite clear about where the difference lies. Um, we probably want to look at striking a, a balance in between the two, if I'm honest. So um, we're going to talk about what makes up foods. You've probably all heard of this before. Hopefully not too much detail, but enough to, to get the basics. So carbs, fats and proteins. Um, carbohydrates, fats and proteins make up our diet and all of them provide us with energy. The amount of energy in each of them differs and how quickly they supply it also differs as well. We probably know this but carbohydrates supply us with uh, the quickest source of energy and fats the slowest. Carbohydrates can be simple or complex. Simple carbs can be broken down and absorbed by the body quickly, and they are our quickest, very quickest source of energy. They quickly raise our blood sugar levels, but they're not as long lasting as complex carbohydrates, which are larger, and they need to be broken down into these simple carbs before they can be absorbed. Because of this, those complex carbohydrates tend to provide energy more slowly to the body, but still quicker than protein or fat and they increase blood sugar levels slower, but for a longer period of time. Now, if you consume more carbohydrates or actually anything than your body needs at the time, then the glycogen, the sugar in them, gets stored in your liver and muscles and it converts the rest to fat. Therefore, practically, we want to train with an optimum amount of carbohydrates for you, so it's different for everybody, rather than just eating as many or as little as we can. And note here, lots of people talk to me about carb loading, particularly, particularly around marathon, marathons or big events. It is a thing, I'm going to say, but possibly not quite in the way you imagine. Leading up to a big event, you can gradually increase the amount of carbohydrates you're eating. So your body is at that optimum level we talked about but overeating them will not make you perform better. Um, they'll go to waste and actually you may have all experienced this. It doesn't feel very nice. You just feel very, very full. Now, fiber is actually a component of some carbohydrate containing foods, but it can't be digested or absorbed by our intestines. So in other words, we don't get energy from it. And although it doesn't provide energy, it is a really important part of our diet. It helps keep um, everything inside of us healthy and promotes our digestion. It helps lower cholesterol, especially the bad cholesterol you've probably heard people talk about. And um, it helps promote regular bowel movements as well, and that's quite important. As a rule, because of that, uh, it's best to stay clear from fibre before training, particularly if you're prone to having um, a, a really funny tummy. Um, that, that might be something you can look at to stay clear of any fibre foods. And be quite clear that if you are eating carbs that are low in fibre, simple carbs, and that's probably a, a good thing for pre-training. Now, high fibre foods, so these can be eaten uh, outside of training times, would be whole grain cereals, pasta, bread, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and they are important in your diet. Proteins, um, this is a particularly sciencey bit, but proteins consist of amino acids strung together in complex formations. Because of this complex nature of them, the body takes longer to break them down so as I said before, they are a form of energy, but they're much slower and longer lasting than carbohydrates. We can't access them quickly. So it's generally not what we need to run, but they, they, do, they do have a, a place. The percentage of this protein that our body can use from foods does vary. I, if you eat an egg, you can use 100% of that protein. It's quite high in milk as well and in meat. 
And even though vegetables contain a lot of protein, you can actually only use less than half of it, the same with cereals as well. So when you're looking at protein content, there is an element there of how much our bodies can actually use. And that's, that's something to think about. The body needs protein to maintain and replace tissues to function and to grow. So do that adaptation we talked about when you're doing your training. It's not normally used for energy, but if your body isn't getting enough and enough energy from other sources like carbohydrates, it will use that protein instead. And we can see that because protein um, replaces and maintains tissues, if our body is trying to use it for energy, it means that it can't maintain and replace those tissues. So it's, that's not ideal, really. Our bodies can't store protein in the way they can store carbohydrates. So we do need to get it directly from food. Fats. Fats consist of complex modules. So a little bit molecules, so a little bit like protein. And again, they take longer to break down. But they're actually the most energy efficient form of food. So each gram of fat supplies the body with more than twice the energy of carbohydrate or protein. During digestion, our body breaks down fats into fatty acids, which help the body to function, and these can't be made by your body. The body needs fats for growth, energy, and also to absorb certain minerals, so you can see in vitamins as well. So you can see if you're not taking in enough fat, Whatever you are eating might contain a certain amount of vitamins, minerals, but your body won't as easily be able to absorb them. Fats are also really important for regulating hormones. Hormones regulate our body functions, including reproduction, digestion, temperature, muscle function, sleep, really important, and cell growth. And a little bit like carbs and proteins, if more fat is consumed than needed by the body, it breaks it down and stores it. So hopefully that's a bit of the sciencey bit over, but you've taken something from that to think about how these foods might help or hinder your running. Hydration. Staying hydrated before, during and after your running is, is really important to your performance and it's different for everybody. Water makes up about 60% of our total body weight and it performs lots of functions, including nourishing our cells, carrying food through the body, eliminating waste, regulating our body temperature, cushioning, lubricating our joints, maintaining our blood volume and pressure. Our goal as runners for hydration is to reduce the fluid loss from sweat, prevent fatigue, muscle cramp and dehydration or in fact overhydration. If you drink too much, there is a risk of something called hyponatremia. So basically the body, uh, the water diluting your blood. This can actually mimic the effects of dehydration, but it's quite serious if not dealt with. It's very rare. Um, you're most likely to see it at a marathon when someone is drinking far too much than they need. It would be, I'd say, very rare. For, for you to come across this in your normal everyday training, but it is something to be aware of. Water for hydration is sufficient as long as you get enough carbohydrates from, uh, from the fueling you're eating before or during your run. And our bodies are quite good at telling us when we need to drink, but if you think you're falling short, just try increasing it throughout the day gradually. <laughs> you don't need to down a big thing of water before you go to run. Now, if anyone's experienced or had some problems related to hydration, um, I put here cramping, although cramping is not always related to hydration, then we've got a good podcast that you can listen to. Um, at the end, uh, we'll post it up in the links at the end. It's really, really interesting, actually. Even if you, you don't have issues, I think you'd probably glean some good information from that. And we'll pop that up. Timing. So this is about timing of your fuel um, for your training. So anything you're doing for training. Now, you can eat as many of the right foods as possible, but if you don't get the timing right, then your bodies won't be able to use that food as best as it can. So given what we now know about carbohydrates, proteins and fats, we can start planning our timings for specific types of food, depending on our training requirements. So I've got some examples, hopefully one of these you can relate to. So example one, you run first thing in the morning, 
uh, you've just woken up and you re need a really quick source of energy to fuel your run. Remember we talked about complex carbohydrates, they take a long time to get the energy. That would be no good here because you want to just get up, have a quick source of energy and go. So you choose a meal with mostly simple carbohydrates and low fiber so we don't get those tummy issues. Another example, you're running in the evening, so you've got plenty of time before you run to eat, digest your food. You could choose a meal or a snack that's got some more complex carbohydrates. You can also pop some protein in and some fats as well. The last example, you're on a rest day, a recovery day. Actually, what you want to do is choose a meal with really balanced carbohydrates, more proteins, more fats, because you're not going to be training. So things you can think about, uh, think about what you ate before or after your run, because what we eat, ate after our run can impact the run the following training session. And how did you feel? So how did you feel? How did your body feel on the run? What was your energy like throughout the run? And did you experience anything positive or negative that you haven't done so in the past? Did you enjoy the run or was it more difficult? All of these questions could be related to fueling. They might not be. We've, we've talked about lots of different things, but they could be. Now, fueling during your runs. If you're well fueled coming into a run, you should be able to st sustain a steady effort. We say for about 60 to 90 minutes. If you go over this time and your body doesn't receive the fuel that it needs, it will start to fatigue and worst case scenario, it could start to use some of that muscle or stop adapting in the way it should. It's not particularly relevant at the moment. I think most people are probably running for less than 90 minutes, but it is something to think about if you plan to do that in the future. Now, because both carbohydrates and fat can serve as a source of energy, um, to break this down a little bit more, our bodies can use about 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrates maximum per hour. For those of you who are used to gels, gels have got about 20 grams of carbohydrates in them. Now you have to actually get very used to getting to that maximum level, it takes a while. And if you uh, take on more than your body can, can manage at that time, it actually your body rejects it and that's when we start to feel sick or get tummy ache. But we can train our bodies to increase this and, and use more carbohydrates. So our muscles and our liver do keep a, a store of these carbs or it's actually glycogen for almost immediate energy and they can start using it straight away as soon as our muscles start working. Carbohydrates and fats are a much preferred fuel over protein, we, we mentioned that earlier, but without energy our body relies on fats and actually lean muscle for fuel and we don't really want to be using that. So if we have decreased lean muscle, we've got decreased strength and decreased endurance, and it will lead to a decrease in performance. And fat as a fuel doesn't necessarily come to the rescue in these cases if you don't have enough carbs on board. It takes a long time to convert fat into energy when we compare it to carbohydrates, and you may not get the fuel as quickly as you need. As a general rule, the lower intensity intensity work that you're doing the more solid foods your body's able to handle we're probably fairly aware of that if you do a really easy run you could probably go out or maybe something like a banana is quite a solid fuel but if you're racing really really hard i think one of the last things you want to eat is a banana and you're going to go for something like a gel or a chew or a block we can talk about some examples at the end what I th thought I should mention here, and this is quite complicated to explain, um, is the fat burning zone. I'm going to call it a myth. It's not really a myth, but hopefully we can talk through it. So the proportion of carbohydrates versus fats you'll burn during a run depends on how hard you're working. Higher intensity runs, they require this faster energy we talked about. So you'll use a greater proportion of carbohydrates for your fuel. Lower intensity runs don't require as much of that fast energy, so you'll actually burn a greater proportion of fat. And this is that principle behind people talking about fat burning zone runs. Working in the fat burning zone does mean you're keeping your intensity relatively low, but it means, and it means that of that, the calories you burn, a greater proportion will come from fat. Sounds really good in principle, but not always. 
So although you'll burn a greater proportion of calories from fat at this lower intensity, you'll actually burn more calories overall when you work at a higher intensity. I know that's quite difficult to get your heads around just as I said, but we can go through it again. And that means you could actually burn more calories uh, working at higher intensity for less time than working in this, they call it fat burning zone. And there's actually research to support that high intensity workouts have a period of elevated calorie burn after you exercise as well. So there's nothing wrong with it. And some people do um, go on these low intensity fat burning runs, but they've usually got quite specific reasons around them. And you need to be quite clear before you go out that, that you know why you're doing it. Another area which I think is really, really important is refueling after your runs. I can't count the number of times when I've turned up at the club or a session with someone and they've done really, really well. They finished the session, we're talking and they've got no plans to eat. They probably will eat something, but no plans to eat when they finished. And I can't think of anything much worse than not refueling for all that hard work that you've done. So it's worked, your body's worked really hard. And even if you fueled really well during the run, your body's probably used up most of that energy and it needs to be replaced for your body to adapt and improve, get better. So you need to think of this refueling just as important as the fueling to start with. Don't wait to eat. So within about 30 or 45 minutes of finishing your run, have at least a snack consistent of carbohydrates and that refuels your muscles and your liver back up to that glycogen level we talked about and some protein to repair and build your muscle. This is quite an important window of time. Uh, again, lots of research about how big or small this window is, but we're gonna say about 30 to 45 minutes. And that window of time is when your muscles are most responsive to this nutrition and they'll quickly use it to repair and build. Now for women, this window is most definitely smaller than for men. It's more important for women to refuel quickly. And this translates to probably potentially less soreness if you re refuel properly and quickly and hopefully some injury prevention as well. And I know not all of you feel like eating after a run, uh, but maybe sip on a drink. There's, a, there's lots of carb protein drink mixes of which again, we've got some links to at the end. Once you've refueled after your run, that's fine. You've done everything you need to do, but then you do need to go on to eat what I'd call a proper meal within a couple of hours. So to fully replace all the nutrients, so you get the, the best recovery and you will need to eat a, a larger amount of food. So then I would go back to what I would call normal eating. So a meal with equal amounts of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Remember, we don't need to keep refueling. We've done our run, we fueled correctly for it. We fueled during our run if we needed to, and we got that snack in afterwards. We don't need to keep eating those carbohydrates. We can have a nice, well-balanced meal. And the type of workout you've done should probably inform the size of that meal as well, fairly obvious. But don't forget your fluids. So be really vigilant about rehydrating. Uh, especially in the 24 hours after your run, because it might take a full day to actually rehydrate, especially if the weather's getting a bit warmer. Focus on water first, uh, although many fluids can uh, contribute and be mindful of alcohol at this time. Um, it does actually interfere with your body's recovery and rehydration process, as nice as it might taste to have that, that beer after your run, just, just be aware. Uh, a note on weight loss. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert here, um, but we might be aware that running doesn't always uh, equal continued weight loss. Uh, sometimes it does and running has many, many other benefits as well. But the most simplest common reason for weight gain is that running makes us feel hungry and we can be lured into thinking that what we burnt was actually more than it was and it gives the feeling that a little bit of extra reward or food won't hurt and there is a fine balance if your running um burn exceeds the amount you're eating then then you will lose weight but your performance may also drop um, and that's when it shifts too far in the wrong direction because your body just simply doesn't have enough calories to maintain and it most certainly will not be able to improve. 
Now, if the amount of food you eat exceeds the amount of um, exercise you do or the amount you burn, then it will lead to weight gain. It's, it's almost inevitable. So we want to find a, a, a middle ground, really, where our performance increases as best as it can and our weight is, I'm going to say, stable for you. Um, some people always say to me they put on some weight during their peak training times, particularly marathon training. It does happen and it can do. Your body's probably increased its muscle mass, which is, which is heavier. And it is difficult. I know I can speak about this all the time, but um, putting it into practice is much harder than saying, oh, yes, I'll just eat the right amount, etc." So hopefully there's some um, tricks that, will, that can help us do this. And I can come on to that a little bit later. It's also possible to train fasted, so without food. Um, and sometimes it just comes down to practicalities. Again, you might wake up in the morning, really not feel like eating, and you want to go out for that quick run. So unless you've got some specific goals around fasted training, it's generally not recommended, particularly for women actually as well. You do need to eat something before you exercise because you're not going to get any of those adaptations we talked about. When you fast, you don't have any food, your cortisol levels are already high and that actually counters our adaptation. Um, and you've already reached your maximum oxidization capacity as well. So you're, you're, you're struggling there already. And when we say we haven't eaten for 12 hours overnight, that's not actually fasting, it's, it's kind of somewhere in between. So it is possible to do, but I would really get some, um, some professional advice around that before you go out without having any food. It's always better to eat, I'm going to call them clean foods. So foods that are not processed and generally not packaged as well. If there's an ingredient on the label that you don't recognise, are you sure you really want to be eating it? Um, I think we're fairly aware of this now, but watch out for sugar. Sugar's in quite a lot of these pre-packaged food. Sugar does have its place when you're training, and this is where it comes on to train. Eating for performance is not the same as eating to be healthy necessarily. So we can ensure our diet's got a wide range of foods in it, particularly because the times we are training, we're limited to what we can eat. So when you can, make variety of your food your top choice, top thing. Um, of course, this requires more time and planning, and it's not always possible, but you can make some small changes if you feel that you need to. Now, each person has quite a unique metabolism. Again, this is something that professionals can really help you with. And that proportion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, which are optimal for myself or one person, might not be the same for someone else, and they could actually be detrimental to their training as well. We can do a little bit of experimentation here to work out what we might need, and we can start with a nutrition diary. So again, with your running diary, really similar. Take note of any positive reactions you've got to the foods you've eaten. So you feel not overly full, but satisfied. You don't have cravings for anything else. You don't feel like you need to snack before your next meal, and you've got a really good sense of energy. That generally means that what you've eaten, your body's in agreement with it it likes it and any bad reactions that you have so it might not be as bad as we think it might not just be tummy trouble it might actually be that even though you feel really full you're still hungry i'm sure we've all had that you're starting to crave something you've had a big meal but yet you're still craving something sweet you're hungry straight after a meal and you just feel slow or sluggish or tired or anxious or you can't concentrate that would be a negative reaction to a food and when you start thinking about this, you'll probably pick out some foods that are doing that to you. You can make a note of them. And a well-balanced main meal should keep you really full and satisfied for maybe three to four hours if you've done all your other fueling strategies correctly. And if you're feeling well uh, and you notice one of these bad reactions, if you're generally okay, you're not tired from the day, etc., now, it must be that whatever you just ate wasn't quite right for you, but probably just at that time. So as an example, we want most of our main meals to be equal proportions of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. A really good example would be poached eggs, that's our protein, whole grain toast, carbohydrates, slow releasing, and avocado fats, really good. If you were just to have poached eggs on toast, 
although eggs do have some fat in them actually, you probably would be missing out on some fat. So again, you might uh, have had that and then feel really hungry just an hour later, even though you thought the meal was big enough. Uh, another example would be salmon. So that contains our proteins and our fats, sweet potato and broccoli, which is our carbohydrates. If you change that round and just you thought you were being really healthy, you just had the salmon and the broccoli, probably not quite enough carbohydrates in there, so you might feel low on energy. And here you can start to experiment with adding more carbohydrate, more fats, or more proteins that are necessary to find what's right for you. Now there's lots of uh, quick fix nutrition options, including protein shakes, cereals, bars, etc. They'll never be a substitute for real food, but they can serve a purpose, you know, mostly post-training actually, you can just grab something. And protein shakes are quite convenient and they can help to get the correct nutrition into your body, but they need to be the right type. So again, we've got some examples we can give to you later on. Be really organized. This is important and something you can definitely do. So consider the type of food you need to eat before, during and after your run and ensure it's available to you. So get your breakfast ready the night before, lots of portable options for if and when we go back to work. Take your lunch with you, so take it to work or where you're going to be so that you know what you're going to eat and when you're not tempted to go to the shop or to the snack bar. And as much as possible, prepare your dinner before your evening run so it's ready to go. When you get back in, it's ready. Uh, slow cookers are really good for this and take your post-run snack, the thing that you're going to eat after your run, have that ready. And if we get to a point when we start going back to a club or an event, take it with you, get it ready. Supplements, I get asked about these all the time and just a really small section on them. In theory, if we're eating a wide range of foods, then we should be taking in all the vitamins and minerals, nutrients that we need. But sometimes as a runner and athlete, we might need more. And there are factors which affect how much of these we can absorb. So it might be worth supplementing with a multivitamin. But again, really seek some professional advice around that. As a summary, everyone's different. So what works for one person, I'm sure we've all seen this, I've been on this diet, it's brilliant, it might not work for you. So be really aware of you. And also what worked for you a number of years ago, unfortunately may not work for you now. So be also prepared to change that. This can change between our training blocks as well when we have higher intensity training, lower intensity. The simplest way to overcome this is to pay attention to how the food is affecting you. Don't just dismiss it. And hopefully you can adjust your nutrition accordingly. It's a much better strategy than chasing the latest fad or diet or food. Remember that timing is just as important as what you eat and pay as much attention to this time as you might do your run time as well. And be prepared to experiment. Really good time to experiment now, actually, because um, you can try lots of things. We're not too far from home. We're not running too far. But equally, don't throw everything at it all at once. Make really small changes and note down how you feel. Now, fueling properly for your run has performance benefits, but it might not be the most well-rounded nutrition strategy. So ensure all of those meals outside of your training are really varied and nutrient-dense. Don't forget, be organized, take responsibility for your nutrition. Don't leave it to someone else or the nearest food or supermarket to grab something. And think long term, as with all of these things, long term performance and health, not just a quick, a quick fix. Hopefully that was helpful. I can see Katie getting ready um, a bit longer today and very, very wordy, but we can take some Q&A at the end. I will uh, pass over to Katie, who is doing some calls today hopefully she's going to nod at me perfect yes thank you katie thanks everyone oh thank you so much Gemma. um that is such an interesting topic i think for those of you that have been joining our sessions you can see that exercise and what we do it's so multifactorial we talked about all those other factors last week and nutrition is actually something relatively easy um, and keeping that food diary and being really open to listening to your body um, versus um, listening to the advert that tells you how you're meant to be feeling when you've eaten these things. 
Um, the other thing I was trying to add some notes for those of you on Zoom to help break that down is really check, I think Gemma said this, really check the ingredients. Um, there's a really well-known smoothie brand um, that you can buy in bottles and it says that it's like mango or peach and if you actually read it, it's 70% grapes um, and that's kind of quite quick release sugar. And so really, really, as Gemma said, look at the ingredients, see what there is. If you don't recognize it, really go and research it. There are amazing nutritionists out there who can also advise you very specifically on multivitamins, um, fatty acids, essential fatty acids. And looking at the quality of what you're eating is really important. Um, and you're better off kind of, you know, eating something that's better quality and then your body's going to get better use from it. So today I am going to go through some core strengthening exercises. I find it always a bit strange to talk to you kind of lying down on the mat, but my room is not big enough for other cameras. So core for those of you who have been joining in, it's really an important part of our strength and conditioning for running. Um, physios and PTs and health professionals and coaches and most people I've heard of this phrase, you know, strong core reduces the risk of injuries, strong core can kind of help reduce back pain, it can help improve my posture. And with all strength and conditioning, it's, it's part of those factors. So we've talked about general leg strength, we've talked about balance, which can also be part of core. And today, very specifically, we're going to be talking about your abdominal muscles. I am a qualified Pilates teacher and obviously I'm a physio and how I define core versus I think what people sometimes think about from an athletic point of view is slightly different. Core does mean upper body postural muscles as well, we're not really going to focus on that today and core does mean our hip muscles and our glute muscles, so those are our hip abductors and our gluteals. And I've done um, a couple of teachers of those already. So just to say that it isn't just abdominal muscles, it's about the control in the whole area. I like to divide it up into what I call power core and control core. And to be very clear that just because you're looking at someone and they look like they're toned, they look like they've got a six pack, it doesn't mean to say that their core is working efficiently for them. Um, it means that it looks, it looks good, possibly, <laughs> if, you, if you like people with six packs. Um, it's what we're told as a society looks good. But it doesn't mean you have control. Now, how to define this power core? So let's imagine um, the difference generally between men and women. Um, men are more likely, not everybody, but more likely to be able to do a push-up. A man who has done no exercise for a very, very long time could possibly get off the sofa and do a push-up. And I know plenty of women who are really fit and healthy yet still struggle with a push-up. That doesn't mean that the woman is less healthy, it means that the man has capacity to generate power. So when we're looking at strengthening, things like crunches and planks tend to generate power and maybe you can hold a plank for 60 seconds or a minute or two it doesn't necessarily translate into having a good strong core for function because when we're running we're not just staying still so i think it's really important to develop this power and we can sometimes call it endurance so how long can we hold a static position for? Plus, we have an ability to control movement because our core is strong enough to support us when we do things that are a little bit more dynamic. Now, as a Pilates teacher, I would say I normally have a go-to of using my Pilates repertoire as part of these exercises. And I'm gonna use those today, but pick out some of the familiar exercises that many of you will know, but hopefully give you a little bit of a different spin on it. I'm not going to be doing sit-ups today. I think they have a place, but being able to do a good sit-up doesn't necessarily mean that we've got control um, for when we're running or when we're doing sport. 
So we're going to look at three exercises. We are going to look at the plank because, as I said, you know, having a component of endurance and power is good. We're going to look at an exercise called the Superman exercise. Well, that's what that's what I name it. I think we all name um, our own things. And I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to control during a core exercise and show you what a non-controlled core exercise looks like and something that's controlled. And what I love about control is that when you're using your control to the best of your ability, the exercise to an outsider actually looks much easier, but to the person who's doing it, it's actually much harder. So let's start off with the plank. Um, the important thing to say about all of these exercises is that they're in isolation and there are progressions for each of these exercises. So most physios, Pilates teachers, health professionals should be able to grade you according to what you can do. So there is nothing that upsets me more if someone's trying to do an exercise that their body isn't ready for and they're feeling really sore and uncomfortable. So as always, this is just some guidance and please check in with yourself if you feel it's appropriate to do. Now, I'm not bringing my pure Pilates hat and talking about breath work and what we call our deep core muscles today. This is a bit more generalized. So, hopefully you'll be able to see me nice and well. I normally lose my head or my feet at some point in this. So, if I keep looking up, it's just because I'm checking myself on the camera to tuck myself in. So, the first thing that we're going to talk about is kind of what I call like a, a short plank. So a short plank, my feet and knees are underneath my hips. I, as a Pilates instructor, if you watch what I'm doing with my low back, the whole thing about this in all of these exercises that I'm really aware of what my spine is doing. Being in a neutral position for my spine is really important and that means my core very simply is going to activate in a better way. So I go up, I go down, up and down, and I find halfway, so this is my neutral spine. My head is looking down, and if you watch my toes, all I'm going to do at the moment is just do a tiny lift, and I'm just gonna hover off the mat. And that's it, and if I'm a beginner, that may be all that I do, and then I relax, and then I'll do that again, I tuck my toes under, I do the lift and I come back down. That is a lovely exercise to do and you can gradually build up your hold. As always, it can feel quite intense on the wrist, so just shake your hands as you need. We'll do it once more. I call this the box plank. And you'll see that there's a softness in my elbows. I'm trying not to snap them and down. Now another progression for this is coming into the long plank. So my hands go forwards onto the mat and I'm going to come up into box and then I'm going to drop forwards and if you again have a look at my pelvis I'm not up in the air. I'm really trying to stay in that neutral position and then I come back into box and I can come down and I can have a rest. And I'll do that again. My hands can come forwards, push up, come along, lovely long head, come back into box and go down. By making sure my back is in that nice position, I am using a little bit of control I'm using some power and some strength through my arms and some endurance. Now people often ask, is there another way to do this if they have sore wrists? I'll show you a variation. It is harder. The first level is a little bit harder than the box for some people, but having been a teacher for ages, some people find something hard and some people don't. So it's really personal nothing hurts and it takes time to build up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I call the propped up plank. 
and you need to be focusing on this area. And if I come into here, I'm going to be resting from just above my knees down, and this part is going to be up in the air. So just have a look. I lie down, my arms are there, my head's lovely and long. I'm not using my feet. All I'm going to do is lift my hip bones up off the mat. So I'm resting on my knees and maybe my shins. Head is nice and long and you can see my tummy and my hip bones are lifted all the way down to the mid thigh. And then come back down. What's important, this isn't cobra or sphinx, I'm not arching. It's not coming into a squat. I'm just propping up, which is why I call it propped up plank. And down. Um, and yes, we have our traditional kind of long plank, which is just that, and just holding. Again, you can come down to your knees and relax, and you can be building that up. So, those are four variations on plank. That is our endurance exercise. If it's something you've not done before, start with the easier versions, start with the box, or start with a propped up plank. And then when you feel strong, when you can hold that for a good 10 to 15 seconds, you can go to the two versions of the longer planks. As I said before, men typically are a little bit stronger in their upper body. So you may, as a woman, feel that there is a bit more effort. It's, it's just a generalization, just from kind of what we see in the anatomy of how we're built. So we're going to go into our first control exercise. I love this exercise, um, simply because it looks really easy to do and it's not. So if you're joining in, have a little watch. So I'm going to come onto my hands and knees again. And I'm going to find that centre position of my back. Because that really helps my core engage. Now, as I said, a lot of people know this one as Superman. And it's opposite arm and opposite leg lengthening away. What's really important is that every part of this, as soon as I start, till I stop and sit back, I am doing the exercise. So it's not just when I lift my leg, we start to work our core muscles when we really work hard for our changeover. To make sure our core is active, it's all about basically, if you think about how still can I be? The more I rock, the less my core is working. Maybe think about an ankle that's weak. You know if your ankle's really rocking around, that it's not being activated as much as an ankle that stays really still when you balance on one leg. So let's go for this. So we're gonna go into opposite arm, opposite leg. And you're being as still as you can and what you're watching for is, if you look at my back there, just kind of done this incorrectly, I'm really arching. So I'm staying really long, lovely neutral spine. Now this is where it gets hard. You're going to bring your hand down, you're going to bring your leg down, and you're going to see if you can pause, and if you can change your leg without wobbling or rocking. Try not to go too hard and too high. Can you change your leg without rocking? We'll go again. Can you lengthen? Obviously you can build up the hold. Can you change without rocking or wobbling? Let's do one more. and then come back. What you'll often see people do is lift too high, so they're going to strain their back. When they change, this is what normally happens, I'm lifting, I'm lifting, I'm lifting, so their head's up, 
and they're kind of doing this little wiggle and sachet <laughs> kind of on the mat. The slower you are, the more control you have, the more effective you are at working those core muscles. So, that's a lovely one to have a go at. Maybe if you aren't in lockdown by yourself, get someone to have a look at you. We can video you and you can see how much you're potentially rocking. And as always, there are progressions for that. You can build up your hold, you can add variations for your glute muscles. But again, really focusing on control, because like that ankle we talked about, you're going to really work that much harder. Now, our first kind of Pilates exercise, those two were Pilates, but something that's a bit different. We're going to use that idea of trying not to rock. Now, please don't feel overwhelmed by this teach. Um, it may be something that you need to look back on my YouTube channel, Katie Neal Physio and Pilates. I've put a few intro to Pilates videos up, and it may be that you need to have a, a watch of some of the stuff on there if you're not quite following this exercise and then come back to this. So, I'm gonna start off lying down on my back, feet, knees, hip width apart. And if, don't feel embarrassed if you don't know where that is. So the really quick thing that you do is you bring your feet together, you open your toes, you open your heels. Okay, so that's in line. As always with exercise, you wanna make sure that your head is supported. You know, if you put your head down and you feel that you're tipping back, these are lovely little Pilates pads. You can kind of you just get a towel. You saw when I was on my hands and knees, how I rocked my back to find that center. And that's really important with this exercise. When I watch people in the gym, they're doing quite high level stuff, high level core, but their back is just arching. Now, as soon as your back is arching and rocking, either forwards and back or side to side, you're not really working your core to the best. Yes, do you know what? If you're doing something very hard, your abdominal muscles will kick in, you will walk out with a six pack, um, but there are better ways to do it, better ways to really activate that core at a lower level, making sure we're gonna reduce the risk of any injury. So how do we find that center in line? Super simple. You can use your hands as a diamond, pop it on your pelvis, and we're gonna flatten our back so there's no gap between the pelvis, the small of our back and the floor. So if I use my fingers, I can't get them through. I'm gonna go the other way, and that creates this big hollow, this big tunnel that my arm can get all the way through. And I'm gonna find halfway, very simply, it's like I could get my um, tips of my fingers just under my back, but not further. From here, we're gonna skip, I'll be honest, we're skipping out seven levels. Um, so if you try this at home and no matter what you do, you're going, I just can't stay still. Please, you haven't, you haven't failed, you've not missed this out. It's just, you need to come and see a Pilates teacher or you need to come and you need to do this from the beginning up. Um, so if we show you this as an exercise, if you watch this area, so my arms are gonna be up, but your arms would be down. I'm gonna lift my leg up to this position and I'm gonna pop it down. And I'm just gonna practice doing this without any movement of my back. Now, if you're doing this for the first time, you may feel as you pick up your leg that your back wants to tip, but when you just about get your foot down, again, your back wants to tip. So really focus on, can you move into this, we call it single tabletop, but this 90 degree position without any rocking. And then can you do that on your other side? Can you stay really still? It won't feel like you're working your core as to what you think as abdominal muscles, but actually trying not to rock is the first level of our core control. Can you do this with each leg? You're probably gonna go slower than I am. And even as you change your legs, trying to not rock side to side, like we practiced on hands and knees. Trying to make it as still as you can. And you'll notice if you look at my feet, how slowly I'm putting them down 
to help me keep control. Now, say you've practiced that and you've got good at that. The next level is to have both legs up in the air. So I'll very gently lift one leg. Again, focusing on no movement at all through my back. I'll lift my other leg up. Now, just holding it here, that's going to work my endurance. But lowering one leg down without rocking, lowering the other leg down without rocking, that really works my control. I need to have really good control in my core to be able to move my legs without rocking. And most people, when they try this, if you're doing this at home, you'll really notice how your back rocks. Maybe you'll notice that you rock side to side. Maybe you'll feel your back muscles kick in. All of those mean that you're not quite using the right muscles. So let's have a go again. I'll put my arms up so you can see. I found that halfway position. I slowly lifted one leg and I lifted the other leg and I'm staying super still and I'm lowering one leg down without rocking and I'm lowering the other leg down. Let's go again. Lift one leg up, keep myself still. Lift the other leg up, keep myself still. Lower one leg down, keep still. Lower the other leg down, super still. So we call this double tabletop. You'll probably just see this people doing this in the gym. And if you can do that, can you tap a foot and come back up? Can you tap a foot and come back up? And at no point, I'm keeping my arms up so that you can see, should my back be tipping? And my core has to work because it's making sure that I stay really still. And this is called controlled core or endurance. What you'll often see in the gym is people doing this exercise. I'm going to do it well and then I'm going to do it badly. They call this dead bug. So this is a version of dead bug. And if you look at my back, I'm being nice and still. So I'm working quite hard as I do this in my core. What you'll see in the gym is this. <laughs> I love this when I see it. So yes, you know what? I don't want to hurt myself, so my body will make this work. But look at the difference in technique. And I promise you, I'm working much harder, much safer, and I'm not rocking versus this wiggle, 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 wiggle. So, let's come up. My hair is always a massive mess after I do this. <laughs> let's take it out. So hopefully that's a little bit of an idea for three exercises that you could build into your program. We've got our plank, looking at the progression. We've got our superman. And that's really, again, starting to introduce you to that idea of where your spine should be to activate your core. And the idea of not rocking. And like an ankle, if we're really still, we know that it's working harder. Even, you probably couldn't tell me what muscles are working if you can balance, but you know that that's better. We've then got into kind of some exercise where we're relying on our back, really playing with that idea again about that center position of our spine and how we can work much safer and much harder if we really think about our control. You've got that exercise where you're practicing just one foot, lifting up and down, trying not to rock. And then that progression up into what we call up, up, down, down, to the toe taps, and then I just showed you an example of the dead bug. Um, and hopefully you could see that quite clearly between the controlled version and the non-controlled version. And, and remember that these are just a few cherry picked exercises that if you're really struggling, it doesn't mean that you're failing. It may mean that you just need a little bit more one-to-one -one supervision. Our bodies are all different. And one of the things I'm really passionate about is making sure that everyone as an individual is getting exercises that are right for them. I'm just gonna hand over to Gemma and see if she's got anything else to add about that. 
Hi, Katie, thank you. Um, really good. Uh, and just echoing what you've said, really, I, I really wouldn't underestimate it. Um, from a personal point of view, um, I often have some problems with, with my back, not necessarily related to my core. Um, I, for instance, lift very heavy weights in the gym during or outside of competition period but I still do all three of those exercises at that very beginner level that Katie showed us there. Um, just because I'm doing lots of other stuff doesn't mean I don't incorporate them. I generally do them um, and my PT still makes me do them in that very simple way to start with. So don't underestimate it. Um, I don't have a, a stat on this, but I thought it was interesting. If for instance, you um, run and you move your arms in a, a, a non kind of, um, a side to side way let's say um, you're actually using up to 10% more oxygen so if your core is not stable and strong and all the things Katie talked about it is possible I don't know for sure that you could also be doing something similar to that and if you ask me how high can I improve my running 10% more and I said to you right you need to do that very simple bot, that very simple plank you'd probably say oh no forget it until you saw Katie do all of that stuff so I just thought it was really relevant um, which is good and hopefully people can pick up on it and you can most definitely start to do it at home which you can't do with some of these other complicated things that we see uh, surrounded running so that, that's my point of view but thanks Katie it was useful. Oh, thank you, Gemma. Now I'm back up in standing, which is a bit easier to talk. Yeah, don't don't underestimate this. And, and please, if you've joined us for all of these series, running is multifactorial. Um, you can actually have a core from an abdominal point of view that seems to be um, relatively strong, but maybe you're having recurrent problems because your glute muscles aren't firing or your hip muscles aren't firing. We haven't really talked about injuries to the to the legs and the calf because we wanted to keep it quite centralized and kind of quite centralized is the wrong word Katie um kind of quite specific to really simple things where there's loads of evidence about things that can make you stronger it could be that you need to be foam rolling more it could be that you actually do need to have someone look at your running it could be that you've got your pacing wrong but Gemma said these are things that you can start doing at home and we've tried to just pick like one glute exercise and one abductor exercise and some balance exercises and a few core things so you're not overwhelmed because we had a really great question last week about fitting it all in and it is hard we're not professional athletes where that's all they do I really appreciate that people have a huge amount on their plate but it is about getting that balance alongside the fun part which for everybody is the running it is about feeding in so I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us for these run sessions. I have a feeling it's probably not the last time Gemma and I will do something, but it is for now. If you have missed any of the sessions, you feel that you want to watch them again because there is a huge amount of content within each session. There's always a talk and there's a practical demo. They're uploaded onto the Facebook page for with Physio. They're on my YouTube page, Katie Neal Physio on Pilates. As always, you can contact Gemma and I. Feel free to share them with your friends. We've just wanted to give everybody this free content for them to use. Gemma, is there any final words at all? No, not for me. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us. And actually, this was Katie's uh, idea to start with. So thank you, Katie, for having me on board, actually, because I've really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, thank you. To, to everyone and to Katie and hopefully yeah this won't be the last time and we'll, we'll speak to you again soon. Cool. All right everybody so we're going to say um, bye for now from Warren with Physio and hopefully maybe see you guys face to face after lockdown. <laughs>